It is widely believed in the West that Russian President Vladimir Putin's decision to invade Ukraine was not a rational act. On the eve of the invasion, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson suggested that perhaps the United States and its allies had not done enough to deter an irrational actor, and we have to accept at the moment that Vladimir Putin is possibly thinking illogically about this and doesn't see the disaster ahead. U.S. Senator Mitt Romney made a similar point after the war started, noting that, by invading Ukraine, Mr. Putin has already proved that he is capable of illogical and self-defeating decisions. The assumption underlying both statements is that rational leaders start wars only if they are likely to win. By starting a war he was destined to lose, the thinking went, Putin demonstrated his non-rationality. Other critics argue that Putin was non-rational because he violated a fundamental international norm. In this view, the only morally acceptable reason for going to war is self-defense. But the invasion of Ukraine was a war of conquest. Russia expert Nina Khrushcheva asserts that, with his unprovoked assault, Mr. Putin joins a long line of irrational tyrants. And she goes on to argue that he seems to have succumbed to his ego-driven obsession with restoring Russia's status as a great power with its own clearly defined sphere of influence. Bess Levin of Vanity Fair describes Russia's president as a power-hungry megalomaniac who harbors imperial ambitions, so much so that he decided to attack a neighboring country. Former British ambassador to Moscow, Tony Brenton, argues that Putin's assault on Ukrainian sovereignty and almost clinical obsession with bringing the country to heel reveal that he is an unbalanced autocrat, not the rational actor he once was. These claims rest on common understandings of rationality that are intuitively plausible, but ultimately flawed. Contrary to what many people think, we cannot equate rationality with success and non-rationality with failure. Rationality is not about outcomes. Rational actors often fail to achieve their goals, not because of foolish thinking, but because of factors they can neither anticipate nor control. There is also a powerful tendency to equate rationality with morality since both qualities are thought to be features of enlightened thinking. But that, too, is a mistake. Rational policies can violate widely accepted standards of conduct and may even be murderously unjust. So what is rationality in international politics? Surprisingly, the scholarly literature does not provide a good definition. For us, rationality is all about making sense of the world, that is, figuring out how it works and why in order to decide how to achieve certain goals. It has both an individual and a collective dimension. Rational policymakers are theory-driven. They are homo theoreticus. They have credible theories, logical explanations based on realistic assumptions, and supported by substantial evidence about the workings of the international system, and they employ these to understand their situation and determine how best to navigate it. Rational states aggregate the views of key policymakers through a deliberative process, one marked by robust and uninhibited debate. In sum, rational decisions in international politics rest on credible theories about how the world works and emerge from a deliberative decision-making process. All of this means that Russia's decision to invade Ukraine was rational. Consider that Russian leaders relied on a credible theory. Most commentators dispute this claim, arguing that Putin was bent on conquering Ukraine and other countries in Eastern Europe to create a greater Russian empire, something that would satisfy a nostalgic yearning among Russians, but that makes no strategic sense in the modern world. President Joe Biden maintains that Putin aspires to be the leader of Russia that united all of Russian speakers. I mean, I just think it's irrational. Former National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster argues, I don't think he's a rational actor because he's fearful, right? What he wants to do more than anything is restore Russia to national greatness. He's driven by that. But the fact is that Putin and his advisors thought in terms of straightforward balance of power theory, viewing the West's efforts to make Ukraine a bulwark on Russia's border as an existential threat that could not be allowed to stand. Russia's president laid out this logic in a speech explaining his decision for war. With NATO's eastward expansion, the situation for Russia has been becoming worse and more dangerous by the year. We cannot stay idle and passively observe these developments. This would be an absolutely irresponsible thing to do for us. 
He went on to say, For our country, it is a matter of life and death, a matter of our historical future as a nation. This is not an exaggeration. This is a fact. It is not only a very real threat to our interests, but to the very existence of our state and to its sovereignty. It is the red line which we have spoken about on numerous occasions. They have crossed it. In short, this was a war of self-defense aimed at preventing an adverse shift in the balance of power. It is worth noting that Moscow preferred to deal with the growing threat on its borders through aggressive diplomacy, but the United States and its allies were unwilling to accommodate Russia's security concerns. This being the case, Putin opted for war, which analysts expected to result in the Russian military's overrunning Ukraine. Describing the view of U.S. officials just before the invasion, David Ignatius of the Washington Post wrote that Russia would quickly win the initial tactical phase of this war if it comes. The vast army that Russia has arrayed along Ukraine's borders could probably seize the capital of Kiev in several days and control the country in little more than a week. Indeed, the intelligence community told the White House that Russia would win in a matter of days by quickly overwhelming the Ukrainian army. The Russian decision to invade was also the product of a deliberative process. Again, many observers dispute this point, arguing that Putin operated alone, without serious input from civilian and military advisors, who would have counseled against his reckless bid for empire. As Senator Mark Warner, the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, puts it, he's not had that many people having direct inputs to him. So we're concerned that this kind of isolated individual has become a megalomaniac in terms of his notion of himself being the only historic figure that can rebuild old Russia or recreate the notion of the Soviet sphere. Former ambassador to Moscow, Michael McFall, suggests that one element of Russia's non-rationality is that Putin is profoundly isolated, surrounded only by yes-men who have cut him off from accurate knowledge. The available evidence tells a different story. Putin's subordinates shared his views about the nature of the threat confronting Russia, and he consulted with them before deciding on war. The consensus among Russian leaders regarding the dangers inherent in Ukraine's relationship with the West is reflected in a 2008 memorandum by then-Ambassador to Russia, William Burns. It warned that Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, not just Putin. In more than two and a half years of conversations with key Russian players, from knuckle-draggers in the dark recesses of the Kremlin to Putin's sharpest liberal critics, I have yet to find anyone who views Ukraine in NATO as anything other than a direct challenge to Russian interests.